Good to see everybody here this morning. It's a little cool out there, a little bit wet. Um, glad you made it. Uh, glad you are be here for our Bible class this morning. As you can tell, this is not the usual face that you see up here. Um, thankful for the, the great job that uh, Brother Kenny has been doing up here, teaching us the Beatitudes. Uh, I'm not going to try to continue to teach his class or his next piece or, you know, derail what he's doing. I'll let him do that. So we'll We'll talk about something completely different this week, kind of change pace, and then when he gets back in a, a couple of weeks, I believe it is, we'll get back into the Beatitudes. But before we get started, what updates do we have from 
a prayer request standpoint. And, and do we have a volunteer maybe that will jot some of these down and, and lead that prayer for us? Who do you want to do that? I don't know names well enough to just call me. I could, but. <laughs> I'll go ahead and do it. Jamie's got it. Thank you, sir. Any updates to the prayer request? We need to be mindful of. I have good ones. All right. My youngest son is his family on finally going to China. I have a good one. They believe I'm going to go. It's very good to have you back as well. Absolutely. We need to pray for Gary and his family. That's right. That's exactly right. Several folks traveling, and Gary and his wife are in Idaho. They're uh, he and others, right, going to Egypt as well together soon. So I'm very Gary ran out of potatoes. <laughs> He's going to the right place for potatoes. All right. Anything else? All right. If not, come on in. Good morning. If not, as folks get settled in, we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our study. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name and all the earth. We glorify, we magnify you as our God, as our King, and as our Savior. We're just so so thankful for, for you and for this time to come together. We're so thankful for Jesus who makes all these things possible who is our Redeemer, who came to this earth, who, who walked uh, and saw the same sun that we saw, breathed the same air, and who just gave us the perfect example of, of how to submit to your will. But more importantly, that he lived the perfect life, that he died, and that he came out of the tomb. We're so thankful for the empty tomb that makes all these things possible. And we just look forward to the hope of, of being with you in heaven. Uh, worshiping you for all eternity. We're so thankful for this avenue of prayer. We are we are mindful of all the great blessings that you give us, and we just we are so thankful that Thomas and Callie can now go to China to pick up their son, and, uh, and and we're just so thankful for that adoption process. And it just reminds us that we are that we are adopted, that we are your adopted children, and that we are the heirs of your kingdom. We just pray that you'll be with them as they raise this son, and that that you will just give them the continue blessing of joy each and every day. We are so thankful also that Jim and Elfie are here. We we are so thankful that you would continue to watch over them and to bless them. And we just ask that you continue to do Jim and help his foot to heal. And we just ask a special blessing on all of us to, to be a source of encouragement for them. I pray a, a special blessing for for Gary and for Michelle as they're in Idaho and that you'll give them safe travels back to us and 
And it just helps us to be mindful of, of the upcoming trip for all of our members who are going to Egypt. <coughs> Lord, you know all things. You know that, that there is conflict in the world. And that there's conflict right now in Israel and, and just in that region. I just pray for peace. Uh, but I also pray, more importantly, for, for, for peace and for security for those that are traveling uh, from our number. That, that they're going to go different places to, to just... Lay eyes on on the different things that, that historically relate to you. We're so glad and so thankful that we can see your work, your hand at work in, in, in history and in our daily lives. We're just so thankful that you laid out for us your word and your will in the in your word that we can read it, that we can know what your desire is for us. And it's at this time that I pray that you will give each and every one of us a measure of wisdom, that we will that we will follow Lady Wisdom, and that we will see the wisdom that you've laid out in your word for us. And more importantly, Lord, I ask that you will each, give each and every one of us a, a, a spirit of humility. That we will see not only the wisdom, but that we will walk humbly in your way. That we will that we will put your will first in all things. And as we walk each and every day, we ask that you will. Help us to glorify you and to, and to shine a light on you so that others will see your name and that you will be praised. And as we open in going to this class, I just ask that you open our hearts as, as Dalton teaches us and that we will be eager students and that we will that we will learn and we will take what is open to us and we will apply it to our lives. And all that we say and all that we do, let us give you glory, honor, and praise. We ask this in Jesus' name, our Redeemer and Messiah. All right. One of the most challenging things for me when I have an opportunity like this to, to teach is deciding what to teach on, right? You've got a kind of a series laid out. You know what you're teaching each week, but for these one-offs, it's kind of exciting because you can teach on just about anything. Well, as I thought about this time of the year and, and what's on folks' mind, especially over the next two weeks, I thought it might be interesting to study together a little bit about some of the, the things of, of nightmares, if you will. I've been seeing a lot on the, the the advertisements and ads and stuff about the horror movies and, and ghosts and demons and the haunted houses and, and all of these things. And I think as adults, for the most part, we understand what is and what isn't reality. And, and we can maybe have some fun with those things. But I've been surprised, and maybe you as well, at, at how many, even in the Lord's body, sometimes struggle with these subjects, especially demon possession. In particular, and understanding what the Bible says, as much as it does talk about it, it doesn't have all the answers. I certainly don't have all the answers that we may want to know. Uh, but there are some things that we can draw and be confident in, and it will also help hopefully equip us to teach those things to others in the world that we come in contact, especially this time of year, who may be struggling with this or have questions about it. Let's start and turn your Bibles with me if you have them to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Since we're doing more of a topical study, we're going to be doing a lot of jumping. I hope you'll, you'll jump around with me verse to verse, and, and hopefully we'll paint this picture verse by verse more and more clearly as we go. But I want to start in John 3, the conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus here, and introduce a word to you that's going to come up over and over again throughout this study this morning. If somebody's willing, would you read John 3 and verse 12? This is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Very good. So Jesus asked him, if I'm, if I'm telling you about earthly things and you're not understanding what I'm saying, how in the world are you going to understand if I start to teach you about heavenly things? The word there for heavenly, and again, as, as Kenny said this too, I'll, I'll say the same. I'm no Greek scholar. Don't pretend to be. I, I use tools like you do. I'm a big fan of Esor. It's free software. If you, I'm not. I'm not you know, I don't give any promotional help or, or some kind of commission for telling you this, but it's a great tool. Uh, it's got some of the, the strong Greek on there. So leveraging that, I've learned that this word is used a lot. And the word, I believe it's pronounced something along the lines of eperonios. And, and oranos literally is the word for sky. Epu or epi is the prefix that means above. So the word's literally saying above the sky, right? That which is abstract, that which is not something we can taste or heal, hear or smell or 
or feel or see, etc. It's it's not concrete. It's not physical. It's above the sky. So how can Jesus? How can I tell you about heavenly things if you don't even understand the physical, the, the earthly things that we're discussing? So as we go, I'm not going to try to say that Greek word over and over again, but as we go through these verses, I'll just say there's our word, and, and you'll know what I'm talking about there. It's very, very consistent, sometimes translated differently, high places, heavenly places. Based on your translation, you may see some different things. Um, but let's jump over to Ephesians 1 and verse 3 to give you one more quick example. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, and then dive a little deeper into that spiritual realm, as I'll probably call it more often than not, above the sky, heavenly places. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Somebody please read that for us when you get there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Very good, very good. So we know this verse, right? This is pretty familiar to us. We're blessed with not just material and physical blessings. We have those too, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about spiritual blessings in Christ. And spiritual things pertain to which of our two realms, earthly or heavenly, spiritual. It's kind of in the word, right? Spiritual blessings, the spiritual realm. And so it's no surprise there we have our word at the end of verse 3, heavenly places. The spiritual blessings, the spiritual things are in heavenly places, above the sky. It's a, it's a beautiful word. And looking in, into that Greek a little bit kind of helps bring that to life even, even more so. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. One other verse just to kind of build this picture of what we're talking about, and then we'll get a little bit more into some of the entities of the spiritual realm, if you will. 1 Corinthians 15. Start with me in verse 39. Verse 39. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul's writing, for not all flesh is the same. There's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish, right? So there's there's categories, there's groupings, if you will, even of fleshly things. But then he goes in verse 40 and says, there are heavenly, there's our word again, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. We could keep going, but it's, it's categorized, right? He's, he's addressing what Jesus mentioned earlier too. There's two kind of categories at a high level of, of everything that we know. And those are physical, earthly things, and those are these heavenly things. Now, when we talk about earthly things, we're comfortable, right? We, we see those things. We can touch those things. They're, they're pretty easy to talk about. When we get into the spiritual things, right, especially some of this, the topic we're talking about this morning, it gets a little bit more mysterious, right? The Bible doesn't address every question we have. doesn't need to. We have the things we need. But there seems to be a lot of, uh, of uh, concern and, and worry and anxiety that comes with this topic, especially the concept of demons and such. Turn with me to Ephesians 1, and let me ask you this. I, I want to I make sure you guys get involved. And by the way, as we go through this, if you have thoughts, questions, anything at all to bring up, please jump in and, and voice that. I don't want this to be a sermon by any means. I know you don't want that either. As we start to get into this a little more, when you think of the spiritual realm, who occupies the spiritual realm? What do you think of? What's the who of the spiritual realm? Trinity. The Trinity, good. Good, the Trinity, right? The Godhead. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. They are not flesh, right? They're spirit. John 4, verse 24, God is a what? He's a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. They're spiritual. They're of the spiritual realm. Ephesians 1 and verse 20. <coughs> Ephesians 1 and verse 20 talks about Christ being raised from the dead and seated at his right hand in the heavenly places. You didn't need that verse to know, but there's our word again. Christ, they are, the Godhead is in the spiritual realm. They're in heaven. Christ specifically seated at the right hand of God. Who else is in the spiritual realm? It's not fleshly. Angels. Angels. Very good. Angels. Hebrews 12 and verse number 22. Some of these will slow down and, and turn to and read together. Others I'll go through quickly for sake of time. But Hebrews 12, 22 talks about that heavenly Jerusalem and innumerable amount of angels, an uncountable amount of angels that are in that heavenly Jerusalem. There's our word once more. We know that. Angels are not physical. They're spiritual. They're created beings, right? We've already read that passage down. It's in Psalm. Psalm 148, 1 through 5, verse 5 in particular, I believe it is. 
Angels are created beings, but they're spiritual beings. They're not physical beings. They manifested themselves uh, so that they could be seen at times, sure, but they're part of the spiritual realm. Who else? Uh, and, I, and I say this a little bit loosely, depending on how you define what this is, but who else is in the spiritual realm between the God, outside of the Godhead and angels? Satan and demons. And Sorry? Satan and Satan. demons. Exactly. Satan and demons. That's the other <coughs> side of the equation. Look at uh, Ephesians 6 this time. Ephesians chapter 6. Satan and these demons. We'll talk. We'll get a little bit into uh, more so what, what they are as much as the Bible tells us. But Ephesians 6. Somebody read please verse number 12. Verse number 12. This is one of those verses that uh, can be a little bit scary without reading and studying the topic. <coughs> Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. There's our word again, in heavenly places. And what's there according to this verse? Yeah, spiritual evil forces, spiritual evil spiritual forces of darkness. And he says, you're not wrestling against physical things. That's what we're used to. Right, but he says you're wrestling with spiritual things, principalities, powers, authorities. File that away. We're going to come back to that in just a little bit in another passage that hopefully will be a very comforting and a passage that will make something very clear for us. But he, he says that there are spiritual forces, evil forces that are there. Now that's that's a little bit scary, right? We're we're on the bottom of the totem pole, if you will, when it comes to these powers and authority, with God being at the top, of course, and we'll. See that again, be reminded of that in this study, but then angels and, and demons. And by the way, Christ himself in becoming a man made the statement, he made himself lower than the what? Angels. Than the angels. Than the angels. He is, uh, he became the bottom of the toe. He didn't come and die for angels. He came and died for man, uh, which is a uh, very, very, of course, special, incredible, and loving thing. So the Godhead, we talked about angels, demons are there, these spiritual uh, evils. Now, what would be one other who, if you will, we might say is in the spiritual realm or part of the spiritual realm? People that have died. Exactly, exactly. Y'all making this easy. People that have died, right? When we die, what is, and we'll see the verse in a little bit to be reminded of it, but what is death? Literally, what is what is death? What happens to define us as as dead? When your soul leaves your body. Exactly. The, the spirit, the soul leaves the body. Is our soul physical? No. Of course not. Of course not. It's spiritual. It's part of that spiritual realm, and especially when that soul leaves the body and, and where it goes. So let's talk a little bit about that. So John 19, verse 30. You're welcome to turn there. You don't have to. John 19, verse 30. What are, let's talk about ghosts for a moment. What are ghosts, biblically speaking? John 19, verse 30. When Jesus died, when he says, it is finished, he gave up the what? He gave up the ghost, the spirit, right? So when we talk about ghosts, that word ghost, especially in society today and the way it's advertised in the movies and such, it's a scary thing. We talk about ghost haunting places. And I find it interesting sometimes to look up the, the most haunted places in the world and just see what people are saying. And there's these ghost hunter shows and all of these things that are out there. What is a ghost? It's, it's a soul. It's a person. It's a person's soul that we're talking about in a literal sense. Jesus gave up the ghost. Another passage, if you're taking notes, we want to reference in Acts 12, about verse 23, when Herod dies, his body was eaten of worms, you remember, and he also gave up the ghost when he breathed his last. Acts 12, verse number 23. Right? When we're alive, and I'm moving kind of quickly here, but we'll slow down in just a moment. Two more verses, and then we'll, I'll slow down, I promise. But when we're alive, I think you know the answer. Where is that ghost? Where is our spirit dwelling? Our bodies. Our bodies within us, right? And again, it's God breathed into us the breath of life. It's what makes us different than the animals, right? We have an imagination. We have all of these emotion and all of these uh, things associated with the, the power of the mind and having that spirit. I don't understand it all. I, I won't pretend to. I don't think man fully can even understand in this world to the, the utmost degree. It's an amazing thought, and it's something that we can't see, feel, or touch, but we know we have that soul, and that soul is what's eternal, right? Of course, not this fleshly body. Daniel 7 and verse 15, just to give you a passage that kind of references this, 
Daniel's having these visions and he, he describes his uh, his self as so anxious that his soul was vexed within him. His soul was anxious. It was, it was though his very spirit was anxious because of the visions that he was seeing. He's talking about the soul, the spirit within him. And of course, as has already been mentioned, when we die, James 2 and verse 26, by the way, is the one of the best passages I found to kind of describe death to us. When we die, it means that our soul is leaving the body. James 2, verse number 26. And I, I love the book of James. I love all the Bible, of course. But I love the book of James, chapter 2 in particular, because James just makes it so utterly clear the difference between faith separated from works and faith having those works. And in that context, he says in James 2, 26, whereas the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. When that soul leaves our body, how dead are we? There, there's no degrees of dead, right? We're very dead, though. We're, we're completely, that body is completely useless at that point. It's just going to, to decompose, deteriorate. It's physical. It's not eternal. James 2, verse 26 says that faith without works is, is just as dead. We can talk more about that, but that's not our study this morning. But the definition of dead is right there, right? And that sounds so morbid, I know, but hopefully it, it, it helps us paint this picture of what a ghost is, what a soul is. So now let's slow down and let's get into kind of the meat of this subject. A little bit about ghosts, and then we'll talk about demons, time permitting, as we go through. Let's go to Luke chapter 16. We're going to look at four verses together. Luke chapter 16 to begin with. To talk a little bit about where ghosts go. And the reason we're talking about this is in context of this haunting and this fear of ghosts. Do ghosts haunt? Do they mess with us? What happens when they leave the body? Could they possibly be left behind and, uh, and haunt us, if you will? And by the way, we think of ghosts in a negative sense, but biblically, if Let's say hypothetically, a, a, a Christian soul was left on earth. Would that scare you? Would that scare me? Well, in a spiritual sense, I guess it would. But is that ghost going to haunt you? No, of course not. It's, that's, that's a good. So ghosts aren't just automatically evil or wicked or haunting. I think that's what society has painted it to be. But ghosts are just souls, whether they're from a good or a bad, uh, a person that chose good or bad with that soul. Look at Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. You know this very well. And, and I would, uh, and again, I, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I believe from verses 19 and following, this is not a parable. It's not a parable. And there's a number of reasons for that. But one of them is typically when Jesus is giving parables in, in every other sense really, and says such, you're not going to see the names of the individuals because he's not telling you an actual account of a story that happened on earth. This one does. And so to me, I, I believe this to be, and for a few other reasons, uh, an actual true account, not a parable. So there was a rich man who he doesn't uh, tell us his name. It's not important. Who was clothed in purple, fine linen, feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Not a pretty picture. The poor man died. His soul left his body. And notice what happens. He then wandered around the earth haunting everybody. Is that what your Bible says? <laughs> no, of course not. The poor man died and was, beautiful picture, carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. So just to, to very quickly address the question, are we going to know what to do when we leave our bodies? Are we going to just wander and not know where to go? No, angels are greater than us. Part of that spiritual realm, they can see our soul, if you will. They're going to carry that soul up to Abraham's bosom, to a better place. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side. Where does the rich man who did not live a uh, boy end up? Hades. His soul ends up in Hades. Now, did the rich man decide to go there? Of course not. If he had a choice, absolutely 100%. In fact, he's going to mention it a little bit later in this, these passages. He wants to be on earth. Anywhere but that place, right? A place of torment. Why is he there? 
How did he get there? Now, it doesn't say like it did with Lazarus, but what can we assume necessary inference here? How did he get there? Because you know he didn't choose to go there. He didn't walk into that place. He was a rich man, so he worshipped money above God. He did. He worshipped money above God. That's absolutely right. And that led him ultimately, his decisions, to that place. But how did he go ahead, David? Uh, I was going to say, another part of the torment would be him not only being in Hades, but being able to see Lazarus accompanied. And that's, uh, yeah. that's got to be bad. That perspective makes a big difference. When he sees not only this the, the joys, I use that loosely, that he had on earth with all his money and all those things that he felt was good and great, he's seeing something even better, a comfort that, that we can only imagine. He's witnessing it, but he can't partake of it. It just makes that torture even worse. Very, very true. But how did that soul end up in Hades? Carried well, there. He had to be carried there. He had to be, right? He did not walk there. He didn't choose to go there. In other words, I don't want anybody to, to think that there's any chance that that soul or a soul of a, a person that dies that is evil is not guided to a location because he clearly was. He clearly was. Let's keep reading to see it even further. Verse 24, he calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip me into his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am anguished. In this flame, I'm anguishing this flame. By the way, this seems to be a, a waiting place, if you will, right? The Hadean realm. We're not talking about heaven and hell here. We're talking about Abraham's bosom, arguably also referred to as paradise. And we're talking about the flip side of that, a waiting place for hell in the Hadean realm. It's not named here. It's called a place of torment. Uh, but it is, it is still a place of fire, of heat. And he can see Lazarus. By the way, What's the difference, as far as best we can tell in Scripture, as far as hell is concerned? What can you see in hell? Good question. All the good stuff. What is hell described as? Outer what? Darkness. Darkness. It is, there is no seeing. It is outer darkness. You'll hear. You remember what you hear in hell? You're not here where he saw Right, right. I'm, yeah, I'm talking about that, that final, exactly, that final place. Whereas here, in this particular place, not hell, the Hadean realm, right, again, don't have all the answers here, but he can see, it's very it's very clear, he can see Lazarus and see what was going on. Which added to his, his pain. Verse number 25, and Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, Lazarus, in like manner bad things, but now he's comforted here, and you are in anguish. I want you to notice verse 26, and then we'll move on. Besides all this, between us and you, a great <laughs> chasm has been fixed in order that, don't miss it, those who would pass from here to you not be able. None may cross from there to us. Even there in that Hadean realm, not only can they not escape it and come haunt us, they cannot even pass from one side to another because of that great chasm. Friends, when our soul leaves our body, we're not going to have control of where we end up. We will be taken there by forces more powerful than us, and we will be there, and that will be it. That will be it for eternity. Now, on Judgment Day, we'll be, you know, in, in that place of heaven or hell. I know there's a lot of debate. Are they already in heaven and hell, or is that waiting place still here since Jesus died? That's a, that's a whole other topic. But either way, I promise you, one way or another, we will be in a better place or a worse place when we die, and there will be no leaving. There will be no coming and haunting or, or seeing anyone again. And as you read on, we'll move on for a second time, as you read on, you see him out here. If he can go to earth, they could send somebody to earth to teach his family so that they don't end up in that same place. Very powerful message. Any thoughts on this before we continue forward? Yes, sir. There's, there's another thing too. I think it sort of gives us a time frame. You know, it, we have a uh, uh, we have a name, Lazarus, and then I think we have a time frame here where he talks about he has Moses and the prophets. It makes you think that it's quite a bit before Jesus' time. So you sort of have a time frame along with the name to uh, make it uh, uh, not a parable. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. He mentions, yeah, he mentions Moses and the prophets. He gives it that time. And again, if it's a parable, it's not something that actually occurred in some timeline. 
he's giving us an illustration, right? So that would lead more credit. That's a very good point to this being an actual account uh, situation that happened. I say story. The story almost sounds like a fable, like it's not true, right? It, it actually. Uh, very good point. Anything else? All right, let's jump over to, time is fleeting quickly, uh, 1 Peter 3 and verse 19. almost hesitate to go here because this is a controversial verse too, but it is what we're talking about. It's hard not to, to turn here and at least talk about it for a moment. 1 Peter 3 and verse 19. First Peter 3, 19. This is right before he's, he's talking about, he's referencing back to Noah, the flood. He's going to mention baptism, that like figure we're into. We're also saying, we know that passage in verse 21 well. Verse 19 said, let's go back to verse 18 just for a little context. Christ also suffered once for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So referencing that death, referencing being alive in the spirit, in which... He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now, this verse is, is, it can be a little controversial. I know there are those who use this to teach this concept of a second chance, that when Jesus died on the cross and he was in paradise, he went, I shouldn't quote that, he was in paradise. He went to the Hadean realm, and some believe he actually then talked to those in torment and gave them another opportunity. That's not what this passage is teaching. That would contradict so many other passages if you, for sake of time, want to know 1 Peter 1.11, 1 Peter 1.11, it, it helps to address it, I believe. He's, basically what he's saying is that Christ spoke through the prophets in that time. And so Christ spoke through Noah. Where did Noah have that teaching, that information? Well, God, Christ gave it to him, right? And so he spoke to those people, those spirits, who were there at the time of Noah, but now in the present are aware. 1 Peter 3.19, those souls that didn't listen, that weren't on the boat, have been and are still where? In Hades. Yeah, in the present, in Hades, in that place of torment. But the point I want you to get from this in verse 19, he proclaimed to the spirits that are now in, what's the translation say there? Prison. 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 Does that sound like a place you can get out of and come mess with people? No, it, it is a prison. They cannot leave. It is a place of punishment, and it is eternal. 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. And then we'll just mention the last one so we can jump over to, to demons for a few moments. 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. If there is a passage that names that place of, of torment, by the way, I believe it's 2, 2, uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. Would somebody read that for us, please? <sighs> For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness, hell for judgment. Excellent, excellent. So first of all, the, the translation, I've got the ESV, it translates it the same, hell there. Um, and, and unfortunately, with any version of the Bible, sometimes you're going to get into a slight translation that's not exactly right. Uh, and, it, and so it's important to kind of use multiple ones to look into the original language some, to use those tools. Uh, King James Version, for example, does. I love the King James Version, but it says that Jesus went to hell in Acts chapter 2. Right? In hell, he lifted up his eyes. That's not a good translation. The Greek word here is actually, and I think it's the only place it's used, Tartarus. Or Tartarus, Tartarus, I believe is how it's pronounced. That's how I say it anyway. I may be countrifying it a little bit. But Tartarus, that seems to be the name for the place, the other side from Abraham's bosom, or paradise. And I say that because notice the angels that sinned, were cast into Tartarus and committed to chains of gloomy darkness, kept until when? Until judgment. This isn't hell, but once judgment takes place, they will be there with all of us who are not living the way we are and uh, are safe from our sin in Christ Jesus. So gloomy darkness. But again, I want you to notice the key here, chains, that chain. They're <laughs> bound. They're imprisoned. It will not end. Jude in verse 6 mentions a similar similar thought as well. They are prisoned, chained there for eternity. Any other thoughts on ghosts? We've only got 10 minutes for demons. That, that won't be enough time, but any, any other thoughts about what we studied or talked about so far? All right, let's, let's flip gears a little bit and go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. 
I have seen some argue, I don't think that it's very common, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have seen some argue that demons are souls of evil people that are that were allowed to come and to haunt people for a time in the first century. I don't believe, there, there's going to be a few reasons that will say that I don't believe that that's biblically accurate. If you do believe that, as long as the, the end of our study that we'll get to in a moment, we agree on, we'll be okay. It's not a salvation issue. We don't need to disfellowship each other over it. I knew it. But in Luke chapter 8, in verse number 2, we begin to see some references here as to what demons are, what the Bible describes demons as. Would somebody read Luke 8 and verse 2, please? And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Very good. These demons here are referred to as what in verse 2? Evil spirits. Evil spirits. And I see where maybe somebody would think, well, spirit could be a soul. And so maybe those are souls that are haunting people. What's the other option, though? We talked about the entities of the spiritual realm. It's not God. If it's not a soul, as far as what the Bible teaches us has been created and is in existence in the spiritual realm, they have to be angels. They have to be angels. And according to 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, there are angels that what? That fell. That sin. Yeah, the devil and his angels, exactly. That was where we were going next. The devil and his angels, right? So the devil, and, and, and we could argue there, maybe the devil was an archangel, maybe not, but he, he was an angel as well, and his demons fell as well. They sinned. And so those angels that sinned might very well be those evil spirits as well. Not a huge, it's not a huge deal, big deal necessarily, uh, the beauty you take there, but we'll, we'll see some reasons why it seems to be more so that they are angels rather than uh, souls of, of people. Uh, again, for sake of time, if you want to just note Psalm 148, 1 to 5, talks about angels are created beings. Again, I want to mention that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14 is an interesting passage where it says Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. It's interesting to me because Satan is an angel. So, in what sense is he transforming himself in that passage? What he used to be. What he used to be. That's, exactly, that's a good way to put it. I was that. What he used to be. Originally, when he was created, before he sinned, he was an angel of what? The angel of light. Angel of light. Angel of light. And yet, now he's, now he's fallen. Now he's sinned. And so he's transforming, and just like Jose said, into that, to that light, uh, into something good, because that's not what he is. Johnny talks a little bit about that, too. Uh, Matthew 12, 24. Um, well, I'll just mention these for sake of time. Matthew 12, 24, again, referencing uh, the place, and this is, uh, where he's talking about the sheep and the, the goats will be separated in judgment, and those that are on the left will be cast into that eternal damnation that's been prepared for the devil and his angels, the demons, the demons as well. Um, we could we could call them as, as what they are. And so they are led by Satan, is the point I wanted to make there. The devil and his angels. The devil is often referred to as, in a way that he's, more powerful than these angels. <coughs> He's often, a couple of times at least that I can think of, uh, compared to uh, what, the only named archangel that we know of outside of Satan, which was who? Remember Mark. the name of the archangel? The, the, the actual ca canonical Bible refers to. I know you can get it uh, with the larger, but Michael, 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 yeah. And Gabriel may have been. There's some, there's some debate there, but uh, Michael is certainly named as an archangel. You often see them compared to as equals. Um, disputing over the body of Moses, for example. Revelation 12, about verse 7, um, talking about the dragon, Satan, and, and battling. He and his angels with Michael and his angels. And, and so perhaps he is an archangel, but he is an angel. His angels followed him. They sinned. He led them. And, and here's the point. In Matthew 25, 41, that place that he describes that they're in is eternal. Right? If you want to talk about a, a demon or an angel messing with us today, it would be after eternity ends, right? And when does eternity end? Never. never. It's never going to end. They're, they're not going to be able to, to get to us. A couple of things. Um, we won't turn to these passages. We've only got five minutes, and I, I want to hit a key point to, to leave here on a positive note. They believed in God. They believe in God. I should say James 2.19. Even the devils believe and tremble. What does that say about belief only? Luke 4, verse 41. Another passage uh, where literally they pronounce Christ 
casting these demons out and, and they call him, thou art God, thou art God, thou art Christ, the Son of God. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing. They confess him, they believe in him, but they're not saved, right? That's a whole other topic. But they do believe in God is the point. They cause illnesses. Matthew 12, 22, Mark 9, 8, 9 18, Luke 8, 27 to 35. They caused men in the first century to be blind, to be mute. Uh, one man was roaming around, lived in the tombs naked. He was very strong. He could break chains that were on him. Uh, the individual was thrown down in his body. Uh, he, he trembled. He foamed at the mouth. Very, very awful things. And they could take over and overpower those bodies that they were in. And that's why they're, they're so scary and why the, the horror movies that are coming out showing more about them, right? They did cause those things in the first century. They could do that if allowed to possess. But in every case, we see Christ more powerful having more authority, removing that demon, and boy, did those demons respect and listen to that power. What about today? Here's the point. What about today? Does demon possession happen today? Let's look at just a few passages with a few minutes we have left, and this study is yours. Um, let's go to Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15. Mark 16 and verse 20 is a good reminder of why. It was allowed to happen to confirm the word with signs following. Which is a number of, of miracles there, even uh, uh, being bitten by snakes, drinking poisons, etc., being able to be healed. All of that was to prove to confirm the word with signs following. Because remember, they did not have the inspired, completed word of God like we do today. The new law, in particular, of course. Colossians two and verse fifteen. This is a, a very powerful passage, beginning in verse thirteen. He says, "And you who were dead in your trespasses and your sin." In the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses. Christianity, right? Having been forgiven of our sins. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, that he set aside nailing it to his cross. We go here a lot to, to help others understand that the Old Testament has been done away from an authoritative standpoint. It was nailed to his cross. But notice verse 15. I told you, remember, to, to uh, follow away Ephesians 6, 12, the principalities and powers. He disarmed, this is Colossians 2, 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him. He put them to an open shame. Those authorities, those powers, the works of the devil, I believe it's James where it talks about that. All of that was done away, right? Is that, that's going to cease to continue to exist. After that death of, of Jesus Christ. There are gifts of the Holy Spirit. But was the removal of demons one of those? It's not one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's not one of those that, that would continue on for a time. Uh, until the word of God was complete. Um, so, so much that we're unraveling. I feel like I'm going too fast. But turn with me to Zechariah 13.2. And then any, any last thoughts that you have. And we'll, we'll dismiss. Zechariah 13.2. Zechariah 13, 2. Let's begin. Uh, somebody please read verses 1 and 2. And I believe we'll be out of time. But Zechariah 13, 1 and 2. And that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the name of the idols from the land, and they will no longer be remembered. And I will also remove the prophets and the unclean spirits from the land. Very good. So Zechariah is talking about a, a lot of things throughout this uh, book, uh, prophetic things, messianic prophecies, etc. But in verse 1, what time is he talking about based on verse 1 there? The coming of the Messiah. Yeah, the coming of the Messiah. The becoming of the Messiah. And ultimately, that fountain that's going to be opened up is what? Jesus himself being killed on the cross. Exactly. Exactly. Jesus himself. That blood being shed, that fountain that we can be cleansed from. So in verse 2, on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I'll cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they be remembered no more. And what's he going to remove according to the end of verse 2? Unclean spirits. Unclean spirits. Prophecies, that's another topic as well that we could talk about. But unclean spirits are going to be removed from the land. That, there was going to come a time that that was going to cease. We're out of time. I did a whole lot of talking. Any, any last minute thoughts, <laughs> questions? Uh, in a, a very juicy topic, I know. Yes, sir. The, the only example I can think of 
about somebody being called back from the, uh, the dead, a dead world, is when Saul talked to the media and asked her to bring forth Samuel. And Samuel did not like it. He was at peace. He was at rest. That's a very and so. Good and then he goes back. So you know he wasn't on earth to just wander around and torment people. That's that a very was very That was very messianic. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. Very and that uh, that took the power of God to do that. That yes. witch of Endor in and of herself she couldn't have done that. That's a very good, very good point. The, uh, another, we can talk about Lazarus, of course. Jesus raised him from the dead. What did that mean? His soul came back Amen. from the paradise. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, did he have to have a conversation with Lazarus? You can't talk about what you saw there. Did he wipe his memory out? That's something that's always interested me. But yeah. he took him back from paradise. I'm sure Lazarus wasn't excited about that. No. His family was. Yeah. <laughs> but not Lazarus. Very, very good thoughts. Anything else? I know we're out of time. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. I hope this subject was interesting to you. And if nothing else, reaffirms your faith in what is and isn't allowed by God today and helps us to teach others the same. Let's have a quick dismissal prayer. I almost forgot. And then we'll be dismissed. Father, we're so blessed to have had this time of study together. Thank you for revealing to us the power and authority that, that you have in your scriptures in so many ways. And thank you for reminding us of, of how you confirmed the word in the first century. Father, making it so clear and help us to, to remember these things and share them with others and, and teach them the truth of your word and may doors be open to teach them more important things such as how to be saved. We're so thankful for sending your son to us so that we could be. And we pray that as we take a break here and, and then begin this time of worship, that we'll be able to focus and worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.